good evening everyone a very warm welcome to all of you to the 10th kavya lab vaishishtya session organized by the consciousness studies program at the national institute of advanced studies bangalore so kavya lab uh, like uh, most of us would know by now is conceptualized by dr sankita menon who is head of consciousness studies program and dean of humanities at uh, nias uh, it is also conceptualized by dr shankar rajaraman uh who is a post doctoral fellow there and who is also a medical doctor and a sanskrit scholar and poet uh along with uh, these veterans we are uh, prikona and uh, meera menon i uh, we are doctoral scholars at nias so uh it is it is indeed a great pleasure to have all of you here today and um today we will have gayatri ayer speaking to us about uh, bharatnatyam and poetry Gayatri and uh, Kavya Lab sessions are organized in such a fashion that we have Vaishishtya and Vividya sessions. Vividya sessions is where different poets uh, who are invited into a panel will share their poetry with us, and uh, we have poetry appreciation. And uh, Vaishishtya sessions are where uh, one poet or one uh, specific performer will speak to uh, us about their craft. So uh, we are indeed very glad to have. Gayatri Iyer today, and let me please welcome Dr. Shankar Rajaraman to speak a few words. After which, Preet Kona will introduce the speaker and today's topic. Yes. Shankar, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Meera. Um, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Meera. Um, let me briefly introduce uh, today's speaker after which uh, preet will be uh, speaking uh, about today's uh, program specifically uh, today's speaker is uh, gayatri ayer gayatri ayer is a bharatanatyam dancer dance historian and art historian completing her phd in temple sculpture from jnu new delhi under the tutelage of dr naman nahuja her research is focused on the meeting point of movement and sculpture in indian art with attention to architectonics poetics and placement most recently she was awarded with a grant from the indian foundation for the arts for her work on the dance history of bangalore she has also consulted with intact to award UN, uh, unesco uh, uh, unesco world heritage status to the hoysala group of temples when gayatri is not talking about art she enjoys coaching students in speech and debate uh, today's uh, talk has been titled uh, padanyasa poetry in motion and uh, uh, just to speak few words about the title itself the word uh, padanyasa is a sanskrit word the word pada standing for uh, both the feet as well as words so uh, it translates basically to placement of feet or placement of words and we thought this would be an appropriate title for today's talk because it uh, it 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 is it in fact merges dance with poetry and uh, to uh, further enlighten you about today's talk i uh, i request uh, preet uh, uh thank you so much sir and a warm welcome to one and all uh, so today's uh, session by ms gayatri ayer is going to be on uh, poetry in motion uh, a brief regarding what the talk is going to be Uh, while classical dance forms like bharatanatyam are commonly described as poetry in motion they are also seen as instruments of translation when a dancer selects a piece to present the intellectual rigor with which she analyzes uh, context and characterization is rival only to a, a literature's review of poetry or prose she then has the responsibility of translating the words she reads into movement she decides which gestures and postures are apt for her interpretation of the form and thus creates her own poetry of movement in the process hence where do dance and poetry meet to find common ground our texts mandate that natya is essential to kavya and vice versa but how do we define the relationship to each other how can we understand the symbiosis and parallels in these concepts through the practice of dance and history so uh, over to you ms gayatri uh, we are eagerly looking forward to today's talk and uh, thank you for being on board with us thank you over to you ma thank you so much uh, my special gratitude to 
uh, Nias for inviting me for this talk, to Preet for always keeping me in mind, and to the great, great work that the Consciousness Studies Program is doing under the guidance, the able guidance of Dr. Sangeeta Menon. Um, it gives me great joy and pleasure to be part of an initiative which just a couple of years ago, uh, you know, did not exist. And it was, it, it's beautiful to have seen the art scene grow in Bangalore from a nascent phase to what it is now with uh, weekly events actually uh, happening under uh, the banner of Nias. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And um, I will begin by sharing the PowerPoint. Can everyone see it? Is it? Yeah, okay, great. So the title of today's talk, Padanyasa, Kavya and Natya, Poetry in Motion. I, uh, I have been doing research related to this topic for close to a decade now. And I don't know if I can still claim any iota of understanding. All I can do is share with you what I have learned in the process. And uh, one of the things uh, I find interesting or the way in which I approached the topic is to really ask myself through a reading of texts and through studying Indian history in general, why is poetry important? And why is it that we feel that poetry is such an integral part of our society, of our culture, of the way in which we impart knowledge to the next generation? Why is poetry important? And I kept asking myself this question. And as I, con as I continually started reading text after text after text, beginning with the Nati Shastra, of course, which is one of the oldest treatises in the, the landscape of Indian history, I began to understand that poetry is one of the main vehicles of what Bharata defines as rasa. So rasa is the essential experience of Indian art, right? Rasa meaning juice or essence. Uh, so how is it that poetry is a vehicle for rasa, right? Uh, well, first of all, we need to understand what rasa is to understand how poetry conveys it. Rasa is reactionary. Rasa is an experience. It is something that you feel when you see something or hear something or taste something or smell something, right? Rasa is not the communication of that aspect. It is a reaction to that aspect. And therefore, it is in that aha, right? It's when a poet says something and you say, ah, lovely, right? That is rasa. That is the essence of rasa. And so because it is reactionary, rasa, this, this rasa of, of appreciating poetry itself has been immortalized uh, in stone, actually. So the first thing we will look at is this beautiful sculpture, which comes out of Kajraho from the 10th century Chandela dynasty. Uh, where there's a woman who's seemingly writing something on a tablet and she's very intently looking down at the tablet as she writes. And if you've ever been to Kajraho, or you've ever seen sculptures from Kajraho, you know that the women in, uh, you know, that adorn the walls of the temples at Kajraho are all in different uh, positions and postures and uh, different kind of aspects. They are demonstrating different aspects of Shringara. And why is it that they're de demonstrating different aspects of Shringara, right? What is the purpose of that? And, and because that is the register in which uh, those sculptures have been interpreted, because a lot of them are seen applying eyeliner, a lot of them are seen applying lipstick, some are taking thorns out of the bottom of their feet, some are actually um, you know, uh, pulling or adjusting their saris in different ways. Some are stretched with their hands above their head in what is called the alasya kanya. Alasya, obviously, you know, that, that sort of lazy, languorous sort of stretch. In Hindi, the word for it is angadai, right? So all of these different women in these different aspects of love, and then you see this woman who's writing something. So because of this, we interpret this sculpture to be a woman writing a love letter. It may be, but it may not be. 
it is the act of writing itself which has been immortalized in stone. And that's where we start our inquiry into Kavya and Natya, because we do know that sculpture has a great uh, tradition of interpreting or immortalizing dance, especially dance postures. But can sculpture also immortalize poetry? And the answer is yes, whether or not sculpture is immortalizing poetry, sculpture is definitely immortalizing the act of writing itself. So this is, one great example, but there are several others. Uh, on the left, you see another sculpture from Kajraho, who is writing on a palm leaf manuscript. So those very thin kind of palm leaf manuscripts. On the right, you see uh, a sculpture from the Kamaleshwara temple near Bidar in Karnataka. And those of you who are far more knowledgeable than me in Hale Kannada might be able to read what she's writing on that scroll. And you can see that she's writing in a way that we very, very clearly see the pen and we see the scrolls. We, there's no doubt at all that the act of writing itself is being, uh, we are rasikas of the act of writing itself, right? So writing is being immortalized. And here on the left, you see um, uh, these two apsaras. They're again Chandela apsaras, 10th century apsaras, who are again writing on a, on a tiny, palm leaf manuscript. Why are there so many sculptures of writing? And when we ask this question, we realize that the way in which our ancestors were thinking about writing is completely different than the way we think about writing today. Writing today is utilitarian. I need to write an email. I need to draft a text. I need to send an email to my boss, to my mom, to my dad. I need to confirm my train timings. The act of writing is not seen as an artistic activity. And that's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at here is that the act of writing itself in, in ancient India is, is an art. And so once we start appreciating and once we start our rasa for writing, then we begin our inquiry into dance. And one last sculpture I want to share with you is the one that you see on the right hand side. This is a second century sculpture. So it's about 800 years older than all the other sculptures I showed you. And it is a fragmented sculpture, but it shows a small child, what appears to be a small child, etching on a tablet. It's a Shunga period sculpture, which has the Brahmi alphabet. So not only is the act of writing important to our ancestors, but the notion of learning, the notion of learning the alphabet, the learning the correct vocabulary for writing is being immortalized in stone, which means that the level of priority is that high. And so with that, I ask the question, what does the poet do? What is the poet's job, right? So he employs his skills of simile, metaphor, meter, and rhythm to create a poetic and a sonic experience. So he speaks, but he also hears and is heard, right? But poetry is as much about the manner of speaking in India as it is about the brilliance of the written lines. So thus the idea of the betak becomes very, very important in India, right? This idea of the chamber performance where the king invites a few close friends who sit all around him, who, who enjoy poetry with him. And oftentimes the court poet was called in or the asthana poet and uh, the, the poet was paid a lot of money and told to just compose something on the spot. And often, of course, kings would have fun with this. They would say, oh, you know, just compose something on me or compose something on this ring on my finger. And it would be this great activity of revelry and enjoyment. But remember, the patronage of poetry and dance was always contingent on the king. And so it was really important for him, the expectation of him was that he would be able to say vava at the right moment. If he didn't do that, he was not fit to be king, right? He was not respected by his fellow courtiers. And remember all of these things at the end of the day are an exercise of the king's ego in addition to all of the other things that he does. So when you read scriptures, when you read ancient inscriptions from even from the Badami Chalukyas, from the Hoysala period, from uh, you know different sort of temple 
uh, structures across India, you find that a lot of the superlatives that are used to describe kings are that, oh, you know, he was this uh, amazing dancer, you know, or he was a nartaka, or he was this, this brilliant poet. And that is actually a superlative that's used to describe the king. And you wonder, because you know, court dancers are always seen as kind of being subservient to the king. You wonder why is it that the king is equating himself with, with a dancer? And that's when you realize the priority that is being given to knowing an art well and correctly. And so therefore, uh, you know, the value of dance and poetry in India go far beyond recreational and artistic. The performance of poetry and dance was contemporary, sometimes political, and deeply rooted in the ability of the artist to communicate. And so with this, I ask, what are the components of Kavya itself? What are the components of poetry that make poetry or that define poetry in uh, ancient India? And of course, you have the notion of Pada, which uh, Raja Ram sir mentioned so beautifully before the talk began. Um, and again, I'm just cherry picking a few elements to show you the kind of cursory similarities and then we will go deeper into it. You have the notion the idea of ornamentation. And then you have the notion of chandas, which is read, meter or rhythm. Of course, there are many, many other components, but I chose these three because I felt that they were most suited to echoes in dance. So when you think about padas in dance, you think about pada bedas, right? You think about variations of the feet. And the feet is where you root yourself as a dancer. It's the origin of dance is how to stand, right? But the pada is also a unit of measurement in sculpture and in dance. So uh, in the Shilpa Shastras, we see pada as a measurement of a certain number of angulas. Angulas are finger lengths, right? So the Shilpa Shastras uh, define that images are made because of they, they contain a certain number of padas. Similarly in dance, you say, okay, keep, it, keep your feet three padas apart, three foot lengths apart. So for your body, your foot is the measurement. Similarly, you have the notion of Alankara. So Alankara is uh, obviously mentioned in the costumes and makeup. So the idea of the dancer adorning herself. And then the idea of Chandas, right? So meter actually becomes rhythm and rhythm becomes Thala in the Indian imagination. And that is the beauty of these kind of resonances between Kavya and Natya. But let's take a look at Alankara in, in, in slightly greater detail because I feel that um, Alankara is an often neglected uh, idea because there is uh, there are two sort of disparate schools of Alankara. So poets will say, oh, our Alankara is completely different than all these dancers. You know, all these dancers are external and superficial. But our notions of Alankara involve intellectual thinking and the mind and writing. And dancers will say, ha ha, these poets, they all speak in the air. But then when you dance something, only then you know what Alankara is. So let me try and bridge that gap. So the, there are four kinds of Alankara mentioned in the Nati Shastra in chapter 17, which has been written on Kavya. And I will try quickly to show you examples just so we understand the resonances between Kavya and Natya. So the first thing, of course, which is essential to any poet or any type of poetry is the notion of simile. So in a poem, when there is a comparison based on form and quality, that is a simile. So your face is beautiful like, your words are sweet like honey. So how do we show this in dance? And I hope uh, all of you can see my face because I will be doing some amount of demonstrating. But when you say your words are as sweet as honey, you actually enact the word itself. So your words are sweet like honey. Now, why are we doing this? If I had to show a pot of honey, perhaps I could just do this. But then if I did your words are sweet like honey, I don't know if that would communicate what I'm trying to say. So where does the dancer take Alankara to the next level? Your words, there is a lotus and then there is a bee. That 
is gaining nectar from the lotus. Your words are sweet like honey, which comes from the nectar of the lotus flower. So that extra interpretation, that extra ability is really the ability of the dancer to write her own poetry with her body. And more on this later. So the second function of speech or the second function of uh, Alankara is a metaphor. So an image of slight likeness conceived due to indecision characterized by similar aspects. These are, these are the definitions given exactly in the Natya Shastra. I am not changing any words. So what this means is, imagine you're looking at your lover and your eyes are hazy, it's dark at night, and all of a sudden your lover's face appears like the moon. So your lover's face is not the moon, is not like the moon, but appears as the moon to you. And that is what a metaphor is. So when you say your lotus face, so you would say your face, that is a lotus. Now, if you say your lotus face, your lotus-like face, that is a simile, right? So if you put the adjective in front in terms of order, so you say your, and then you do the lotus, which is the adjective in front, that is a simile. If you do the gesture later, your face like a lotus, it becomes metaphor. So order is also very important for the dancer, right? Because she has to communicate very clearly exactly what is supposed to be communicated. Three, so the, the next quality is condensed expression. And this is one of my favorite, one of my absolute uh, uh, favorite types of Alankara, if I may say so. So Deepaka, the, no, the word itself comes from the idea of light, the lamp, right? So Bharata says you can combine words of different types in a single sentence for their mental illumination, right? So what does he mean by that? So you say, for example, uh, XYZ country is prosperous because the, um, you know, swans, uh, there, there is fullness in that country as there are always swans in lakes, flowers in trees, intoxicated bees, buy lotuses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one more example I would like to give to you, which is actually from a real poem. I will be reading just two lines of a poem by M.G. Rangnekar, which comes from the Nati Sangeet Parampara of Marathi Abhang writing. Uh, I would like to request all the Marathis in the audience, I know there's some of you, uh, to forgive me for my bad pronunciation. I'm just trying to make a point about Alankara. Uh, and I would also like to thank, thank the Asirkar and Kulkarni families of Pune for helping me with the interpretation of this particular piece. The uh, the, the first line, the Pallavi of the piece goes, Rusli Radha, Rusla Madhava, Rusle Gokulasare. Angry is Radha, angry is Krishna, and therefore all of Gokul is angry. And uh, when you try and understand this in the context of Deepika, you'll have to look, Deepika, sorry, you'll have to look at the next line, which says, Kunjavani Latikahi Rusalya, in the garden, the creeper also is angry. Taruvari Janu Anurage. With the tree, the creeper is angry with the tree. Such is the anger of Radha and Krishna. So when, uh, when I decided to interpret this for dance, I was greatly inspired by the, uh, by the interpretation of, uh, uh, you know, the, the doyen of, of, of Bharatanatyam, Priyadarshini Govind who had interpreted this by describing all the aspects of Gokula. So she said, oh, see, there's a lake with so many lotuses, but all of a sudden they're drifting apart. Such is the anger of Radha and Krishna. There are two birds lovingly cooing at each other and one flies away. Such is the anger of Radha and Krishna, right? So you describe the entire environment through seemingly unrelated things to bring out the rasa of what uh, is trying to be said. And thus, this is the, this is Deepika, the, the condensed expression. And of course, the last is Yamaka, which is more technical. It's rhythm and rhyme. 
So uh, for example, the end of two lines containing the same syllable, I'm only giving you an example. Bharata mentions 10 types of yamakas in the Natya Shastra. So uh, the end of two lines containing the same syllable. So 30 days has September, April, June, and November. It's like a good, great example of that, right? So you have this rhyming meter. So then the question is, what does it mean to dance a poem? What are all the elements that go into creating dance out of poetry? So I always tell my students, if you don't know how to read, you cannot dance. There is just no chance. You have to know how to read. And reading is a skill, right? So you're not just looking at the lyrics and the meaning, but you're trying to understand what is the tone of the author and whether or not you have a role to play in how tone is interpreted, right? So I let me just, okay. Um, so what do I mean by that? So the first thing you have to do is when you, and I will read a poem with you a bit later so that we'll, be, we'll get a sense of this uh, through a demo. But the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out who is the character? Who is the protagonist in your poem? What is their age? How do they dress? Where do they come from? What class of people are they from? Are they uh, people who do hard daily labor or are they royalty or are they somewhere in the middle? Uh, what is their motivation for talking in the way that they talk? And of course, what is their volume of speaking? And, and this last one I'd like to demonstrate to you. What, what do I mean by volume of speaking? Uh, I'm very grateful to my guru, Braga uh, Basil, for teaching me that a dancer's body is actually an instrument of volume and tone in addition to being just a body. And how she communicates this is, uh, she told me, she said, how would you ask why to somebody? So the, the gesture for why is normally the shikara gesture. And I said, well, I would just ask why. She said, but why are you asking why like that? If you wanted to ask why very loudly, you would use your body more actively. So if I keep my hand elevated here and I say, why? It's a very loud why. Let's say I want to make it a little softer. I say, why? And then even softer, why? And even softer than that, I don't use the gesture. I just look and I ask with my eyes. And therefore, a dancer's body has the ability to modulate in the way that our voices can modulate tone. That's the, the beauty of, of, of a, a tradition like Abhinaya. But also, it's very important when we think about dance to think about what is the poet's, what is in the poet's head and how can we interpret that and create that world in real life. Uh, for example, when I read Jayadeva's Gita Govindam, I'm so struck by how beautiful his world is, full of creepers and flowing water and gardens with uh, tiny hideaway spots, blooming flowers, bees buzzing, Krishna and Radha here and there, sneaking away, being in love. How do I bring this vision of Jayadeva to life on stage? And I call this activity the idea of mental set building. So you actually create a set with your mind on stage. You say, okay, to the left is a door and then to the right is a, is, is a, a table where I'm going to get dressed. And then behind me is probably my bed where my sari is laid out. And so when you create that environment, then you're able to contextualize poetry for the audience in a more effective way. And so to talk about the power of poetry and the, the, the power of poetry as it is interpreted by dance, I would like to show you one example uh, of, of dance itself uh, doing the, the hard work of interpretation. And it, the example I have chosen, of course, Shetraya needs no introduction to an audience of Rasikas of poetry the 17th century poet who is uh, one of my personal favorites to dance. Uh, Shetraya writes a padam titled Nanne Penladu Sumi, uh, where the protagonist is a young woman and she goes to Muva Gopala, to Krishna, and she says, please marry me, O Krishna. I promise you my family won't even ask you for dowry, right? And you ask yourself, who is the protagonist? What kind of woman would ask uh, Krishna to marry her in such casual terms. You know, she seems to know him fairly well. She's not somebody who 
who doesn't know him, right? She's not some stranger. But then you also ask yourself the question, well, Krishna, you know, uh, cavorts around with so many types of women, so many different kinds of gopis. Who is asking him this question? Is it someone who's young and who's really excited and who's maybe, you know, uh, been crushing on him for a very long time? Is it someone who is a little bit more mature, very, very enamored by, by him and his good looks and his charm? Or it's, is it someone who's older, who says, come on, Krishna, now you just marry me, enough. We have cavorted around enough, I want to marry you now. And to answer this question, I, um, again, credit to my Guru Braga Vessel for teaching me this piece uh, in the way that her Guru, the famous uh, Kalanidhi Narayanan had choreographed it. And when Kalanidhi Mami read this piece, apparently it is said that she envisioned three different Gopikas of different ages asking Krishna to marry them. And the way Brigaka, my guru, has set up the piece uh, is that these three women of different maturity levels, so the innocent one, the middle one, and the mature one, ask. And so in order to see that, I would like to watch the piece and then we'll discuss it. Um, Nanne pendla do chumi, nanne pendla do chumi, e nanne pendla do chumi, naya namu bago bala nanne pendla do chumi.
సన్నులు రాక మునుపే సరసములాడు చురిపు ఎన్న రాని మోగమున నాకేచిన వాసలు తలజీనన్నే పెండ్లాడు చూవి సన్నులు రాక మునుపే సన్నులు రాక మునుపే సరసములాడు చునివు ఎన్న రాని మోగమున నాగేచిన బాసలు తలజీనన్నే పెండ్లాడు చూని ఎందుతో నన్ను లాలించి ఇంటికి తోడుకు పోయి వింద సేయక నా మోవి విందారగించిన సుగ సునననే పెండ్లాడు చూమి ఎందెంతో నను లాలించి ఇంటికి తోడుకు పోయి వింద సేయక నా మోవి వింద సుగ సున నన్నే పెండ్లాడు చూమి తెలియదైతి చిన్న నాడే నన్నలవాడు చేసిన సామినే పెండ్లాడు చూమి తెలియనైతి చిన్న నాడే తెలియనైతి చిన్న నాడే తేలించి మూవగోపాల అలరు వెళ్తుని కేలి నన్నలవాడు చేసిన సామినే పెళ్ళాడు చూమి నన్నే పెండ్లాడు చూమి నన్నే పెండ్లాడు చూమి so uh in this piece we are able to see a few very key uh sorry very key elements of kalanidhi mami's choreography as taught to me by bragaka the first is if you notice there's four characters that come out of one poem so uh mami envisioned the young the mugda nayaka the madhya nayaka and the pragalpa nayaka the the young medium and mature nayakas and at the end she includes krishna also so krishna stands and says aha very nice very nice very nice now all of you close your eyes i'll say one name of the woman i want to be with and then you can open your eyes and as they close their eyes he runs away and again this is kalanidhi mami's interpretation of the krishna of muva gopala of shetraya's krishna who is you know forever a ladies man forever somebody who is uh, you know uh, kind of gallivanting with gopikas 
but is not willing to commit is just not willing to commit to anybody so she has taken one poem and elicited four characters out of it and how she's done that is ascribing each charanam each pada to a different character and a different maturity level and she also uses space as a narrative technique so by making the young one stand on the right the middle one stand in the middle and the mature one stand on the left she creates a narrative continuity so you know any time the dancer changes position from one place to another she is changing character and that becomes excessively clear so these are uh, kind of tools that you don't have when you're writing the second thing that we use all of us dancers use is the the notion of ragam so i just there's one particular example that stands out to me you know atana is always used you know as a sort of aggressive assertive ragam and she 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 decides to use atana for the pragalpa for the mature nayaka who says come on you better marry me now and that really comes through in the last uh, portion where she says teliyane ti chinna nare you without when i didn't know anything as a young child at that time itself you were you and i were so much together don't tell me you have forgotten everything krishna and the way she says is so assertive that atana is so perfect for that particular uh, telling of that story now the original composition was supposed to be entirely in kamavardini but this is a way again to interpret it through dance which enhances the meaning the third thing which i find uh, interesting is the relevance of sanchari so sanchari is the dancer's ability when the music uh, when the words the lyrical music stops and the instrumentalists take over the dancer gets the opportunity to enact a portion of abhinaya in a way that is uh, uh, that tells a story so in the first uh, in the first verse she enacts that story where she's playing a game with krishna and krishna keeps trying to touch her and then when she starts crying krishna says no 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 i'll promise to marry you so that entire episode again is is uh, developed in the dancer's mind in the dancer's reading of the poem and uh, and of course the last uh, technique that uh, kala nidhi mami uses is the uh, the interpretation of the ending so this this inclusion this very playful and fun inclusion of krishna at the end who runs away is again something that comes from her imagination but then i want to talk a little bit about how we read a poem so before we talk about you know we've talked about the brilliance of kalani di mami but let's say i wanted to read a poem and i'm starting from scratch as a dancer how do i do it so i will take a poem that everybody knows which is mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow Okay, and let's try and interpret this as though we were all dancers. So I ask you to join me in this exercise. So my first question is, who is Mary, right? Because there, Mary can be anybody. Mary can be an old person who needs a lamb as a companion. Mary can be a very young girl who has a pet lamb. Mary can be a an evil villain sitting in a lair who uses her lamb as a sort of comfort. Mary can be uh, anybody. Mary can be anybody. So we have to ask ourselves the question: Who is Mary? What are her motivations? How old is she? And why does she have a lamb? That's our first line of questioning, right? So let's say, for the sake of this exercise, that Mary is a young girl because she has a little lamb. I'm going to assume she's also a little girl. Let's say that she is about ten years old. and why does she have a lamb well why do little kids have lambs have pets in general it could be because of empathy it could be because mary was saving the lamb from a slaughterhouse it could be because mary really liked the white color of the lamb there's so many reasons that we can give here right so the first thing we need to do is think about the motivation and why ask the question why the second question you want to ask is how how little is the lamb because if the lamb is very very little then as it walks it keeps tripping and mary looks at it and laughs or mary says oh so cute this lamb is just running off like that here and there because the lamb is so sweet right how do small lambs behave youtube it find ways to bring that element of reality into your mimetic interpretation it's very very important as a dancer right and then we go to the second part of the line 
whose fleece was white as snow. Why does the author choose the metaphor of snow to describe whiteness, right? So for example, if I say Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow, I have interpreted the poem through dance in one way. And as you can see through my actions and through my interpretation, I have given it a specific flavor. I have given Mary an age. I have given her a way of moving her body. I've given her a volume and a tone of asking questions. I have also given the lamb a shape and a form and a whiteness and a brightness, which the word is not, is not capable of giving me in its entirety, right? And the beauty of poetry is our imagination, is, is what we read between the lines. And for that, I'm very, very blessed to have the gift of Abhinaya as a dancer, because it equips us with the tools to create a second level of poetry or poetry in motion, which becomes the interpretive dancing of the original text. So you're actually, there's two levels of poetry. One is the written text and one is what is danced. And to kind of the last exercise which we will do together, I know I'm running out of time a little bit, but just uh, five more minutes. Uh, I want to look at poetry in the Devadasi tradition. And the reason I want to do this is because I think that there is a rigor, a poetic rigor to the Devadasi tradition, which unfortunately, those of us who dance today lack in our training. And we have to keep in mind that dance, while it is a highly codified form, the way of thinking about dance is if it's not communicating to your audience, it doesn't matter what mudras and hastas you're using, if you're not communicating to the audience, you're not doing it correctly. It does not matter how sophisticated your mudras are. What is important is that your message is clear, as clear as it can be. And so to this end, I like to take the example of Bala Saraswati, Balama, who is one of the last great Devadasi gurus to have blessed us with her presence. And it is said, and of course she lived well before my time, so I didn't have an opportunity to meet her, but it is said uh, that those of her who, by those of her who watched, uh, those who watched her performance, that she could perform up to 40 variations of a single line and that too completely spontaneously. It was not something that was highly rehearsed. And um, I had the good fortune of watching Muthu Kanamal, who is the last living Devadasi of Virali Malai, and she currently lives in Pudukote. I had the great fortune earlier this year of watching her dance. And uh, I remember distinctly one piece, uh, which is exclusive to the Pudukote region, which she danced. It's a folk piece called Valli Kanavan Pere. And in the piece, the piece describes Lord Murga in a, in a, almost in a folk or in a Korithi way. And uh, the poet says, Kunkuma Varna Nadi, that Murga has the, uh, the body color of Murga is the color of Sindur, is the color of Kunkumam. And so normally in dance, in today's dancing, how we interpret that is, oh, there is a pot with Kunkumam and this is Chatura is the mudra for color. So kunkuma varna nedi, right? And you'd probably show the body. Mutukanamal did something so interesting and so eloquent as a dancer. I will never be able to forget it. She did kunkuma varna nedi kili. She showed her bindi and then showed her arm. What a simple way to communicate such a complicated concept you don't have the ability to change color on stage. At best, you can ask your lighting designer to give you a different color, but that looks a bit gimmicky when you're describing a god. Kunkuma Varna Nadi. And that is what eloquence is in dance. You're writing poetry. Remember, you're writing a different set of poetry. And that such is the elegance of the Devadasi tradition. And why? Why are they so eloquent? Because they trained in poetry and sculpture and music and in rhythm and in dance. It was not just in one or the other. They all saw it as interdisciplinary and interconnected. And so to that end, I have a one minute clip I want to share with you all. We will watch it twice. Uh, the first time I will allow you to watch it by yourself. 
and it is a clip of the mohamana varnam which is danced by the great bala saraswati herself and the lyrics are simple mohamana in middle oh beloved i am consumed uh, and suffering with desire for you why do you treat me indifferently like this right uh, it's a composition of the tanjavur quartet it's in rag bhairavi in rupakatalam and we are going to watch balama just perform the first line of course remember the second part of the first line is uh, modi shailam so don't be angry with me oh god for uh, for anything because i am so in love with you we're going to watch her perform just the first line for a minute and then i will watch it again with my commentary and hopefully it will make sense it once again and i want to draw your attention to how balama uses poetry within every single line of her dancing so i will be stopping it to explain her interpretations so remember the first line means i'm so consumed by desire and suffering for you that i cannot handle it <laughs> line she does according to what is known as padhartha which is word for word meaning so very very simple gestures now she begins to do what is called vakyartha which is the interpretive meaning <laughs> there is so much intoxication in my heart i am drawn to you as though a bee is drawn to a lotus the moon feels like the sun burning down on me with rays that kind of burn my entire body are you angry with me so to shut a window and sulk inside are you so angry with me that the garland i made for you with love and i placed on your body you reject with me that the paisam i made from the milk of the cow you just throw away <laughs> <laughs> 
because you don't like me. When we sit on the bed in the evening in intimacy and I grind sandal paste and give it to you, do you reject? Do you reject it? And thus is the genius and the brilliance of a dancer like Bala Saraswati. Such is the genius and the brilliance of a dancer like Bala, Bala Saraswati, who through her interpretation, and mind you, she's performing this live on the spot. She doesn't know what she's going to be dancing to. So she uses the techniques of Padhartha and Vakyartha to, of course, dance to what she's dancing. But she also uses the notion of simile and metaphor, right? The milk, the paisam, the notion of flowers, the idea of the moon burning like the sun. She also talks directly to the God. She says, you are mad at me. And she also uses the technique of writing the poetry in her head, writing the metaphors as she dances them. And that is the brilliance of a dancer like her. And unfortunately, none of us who dance today have that kind of training. And therefore, none of us are capable of dancing like that. And so to conclude, I ask, what is the relationship between Natya and Kavya? It is the inextricable link between word, music, and action. It is movement that is used as interpretation for the text. And remember that when you think about Natya and poetry, it is not Shravya Kavya, the poetry which is heard, and Drishya Kavya poetry which is seen. The line is completely blurred. It's a multi-sensory experience. From tapping your leg to keep tala, that's your tactile experience, the smell of the incense and the flowers in the dancer's hair, the sound of the dancer's anklets and the orchestra, the sight of her silk costume and jewelry, and finally the taste or the rasa of her dance is what makes poetry in dance uh, a manifestation of the highest order of human imagination. And with that, I conclude. I'd like to thank everybody. And I'm open for questions, comments, revelations, criticisms. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Gayatri, for so eloquently and beautifully presenting a narrative by not only manifesting uh, to us the significance of understanding or feeling art, but also the manner of its portrayal, while putting across the whole task uh, in the form of an aesthetically pleasing act. You also, by drawing such rich examples, demonstrated so gracefully the gaps between the various uh, forms of art uh, that you also managed to beautifully bridge. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, it was thoroughly an amazing. Uh, I, I enjoyed every part of it. It was a treat to all of us. And now the floor is open for discussion. Uh, if there are any questions, suggestions, uh, you could probably write in the comment box or raise your hands. We'll probably unmute you. Or... Uh, Ma'am, I kindly request you to unshare your screen so that it's visible to everyone. Uh, yes. Uh, there are a few comments on the chat box. Uh, uh, Mr. Srikant says, lovely Abhinaya. Amrita Valdi says, if you don't know how to read, you cannot dance. Uh, there's just no chance. So she says, playing about Yamaka. So it's another Yamaka and lovely Pada. And Shrikant said again, uh, Shrikant said, is there anything you would want to uh, add on or speak? Uh, Niharika ji, if you could unmute Shrikant sir. Um, sure, thank you, Preet. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gayatri. So it was absolutely wonderful. Um, the comment wasn't actually so much about your Abhinaya at all because that was excellent. It was more along the lines of, you know, the usual Kshetriya Padas are much more stately moving, generally said to Mishri Chapu, have much less words. This one stands out and I wonder, I'll probably have to go back and look, is it really a Kshetriya Pada or is it something that's been attributed to him over the period? That is a question that was coming to my mind. But I think, that, be that as it may, I think your Abhinaya obviously brought it to life. And I think the last slide you said, the relationship between Kavya, um, music and po and dance and i think that is absolutely inextricable and i think they are very closely enmeshed and i think our sculpture is a is a stitya kavya 
but obviously nritya is is a kavya in movement and i think that is the beauty of it it interprets it enhances and it brings to life the the written kavya uh, and i think a, a dancer who does it is obviously the one that brings to life and i'm very grateful to you for doing that today thank you so much your kind thank you really mean the world to me you know we spend uh, years hold up in libraries studying these things and it always yes. means a lot to gain appreciation thank you beautiful we uh, we have a few dancers also amidst us today uh, dancers and musicians any comments amrita wali sindushi amira has something yeah amrita i think amrita wali you could yeah hi thank you thank you so much uh, gayatri ma'am um one thing i have one comment and a question so i'll just put it together so my comment is the i never realized that when you're dancing you can actually write a poem i we always learn that you know the dance is a visualization of the poetry but to think of it as a mutually uh, yeah as a reversible direction sort of equation that is that never occurred to me so that's a one way to think of when i do abhinay to think of what exactly i'm saying um and my question was um when uh, there is i always have this hesitation when 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 i find something that i want to dance to there is this thought of am i being authentic to what the poet or the author wrote so where does your imagination and the character that he is encapsulating versus the one you want to do or even how how did kalanandi mami um, get the confidence to do three different uh, nahikas yeah well thank you for your questions a fantastic question first of all kalanandi mami was a rock star and she could do whatever she wanted and nobody would say anything about it uh and uh, so obviously you know those of us who are mortals and who are just coming up we have to the one thing i like to do is i always go spend lots of time with dr v k rangara whenever i go to chennai and i ask him sir is this all right i have this interpretation is it okay and because he knows the language of telugu so well and so beautifully and comes from this long lineage of having learned from different kinds of gurus he's always able to guide me by saying this is a bit of a risk but you can try it you know so definitely one way to figure out whether you're doing it right ask somebody who knows more than you for sure uh but the second the second way to to really do it is is really think about what uh what is the tone that's being implied by the author so like uh, if you think about nanne pelladu itself she says nanne pelladu sumi to me is like oh companion or you know that's a colloquial term or similarly there's that beautiful composition lakshmi rave mayantiki why is the word ve used there that's such a it's a again a very colloquial very casual term so it's little things like that that will indicate a certain tone to you and then you can say okay because there's this tone i'm taking the liberty of making this interpretation so really knowing how to read is the first step but secondly also saying it's okay it's okay if i'm wrong it's okay if it's an experiment i'm going to do it anyway it's okay what's the worst thing that will happen people will tell me i'm wrong okay i'll learn something from it you have to have the confidence to do it because dancers today don't and it is dancers like you that have to take that to the next level and to bring back that art of abhinay so i hope that helps definitely thank you uh thank you uh amrita and thank you gayatri ma'am i think we have a question sindhu uh. hey thank you so much uh, gayatri or gayatri ma'am i don't know how to address you but beautiful thank you so much for taking me out of this mundane world you gave me a beautiful break it was amazing abhinaya and the passion you have for poetry and dance is just evident with the way you speak of it and uh, i again have a comment and a question the comment would be it's it's a language on languages i mean i would you wouldn't have to know a language to exactly understand what is being portrayed if it's done in a dance form that's not the same with poetry isn't it or to understand to actually appreciate a poetry you need to know the language in depth but in case of dance you it's a language of its own you wouldn't have to understand what's being sung you just have to let go and give in to the dancer and she will he or she will tell you what you should feel or what you should empathize with that was 
I had like that's the last part you showed and that was on point what I always think that language is is dance as a form of language and my question is you're a Bharatnatyam dancer but I know you're a well-read and a very well-educated person who knows other dance forms as well I mean what I always got the what I always thought was Bharatnatyam even though very beautiful well explored it's a bit more constricting con compared to many other Indian dance forms. So when it comes to Kathak or Odyssey, they're more flowy. So do you think, for, do you, can you compare, because you do consider dance as poetry, so would you think dance in other, for, uh, other dance forms would be a bit more easier when it comes to exploring Shingara Rasa or Raudra Rasa? If okay, you have I'm going to comments. read your question a little bit for you, Sindhu. The, what you're actually asking me is, Bharatanatyam seems more geometric and straight edge. So how can you communicate effectively with a Bharatanatyam body is your actual question. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to answer your question, yes, you're right. Bharatanatyam is straight edge, but it was not always like that, right? And so it's very, yeah. very important for us as dancers to go back to what an authentic mode of training is, right? And that is well before, uh, you know, the, the, the establishment of Kalakshetra, well before the independence movement, we'll have to go back to what the original Devadasi tradition was, which is why I showed a clip of Bala Saraswati. Because uh, I'll just give you one example to, to explain what I'm trying to say. So there were a lot of um, Odissi people, uh, Odissi dancers and people from Orissa who actually migrated to Mysore in the 17th and 18th centuries. And the Mysore court is the first uh, court to have Ashtapadis as Bharatanatyam repertoire in the Mysore style. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you actually, and I have actually done this as part of my IFA grant work research, when you go and talk to dancer, dancers from the Mysore style, they say, oh, we are supposed to stand in Tribhanga. And you say, but wait, Tribhanga is an Odyssey posture. Why are you standing in Tribhanga? Because that's what our guru taught us, because that is the Mysore style. There's influence of Odyssey in the style. So you have to really work with your body. You have to understand, deconstruct, get rid of the straight lines. I agree with that in order to really communicate in Bhartanatyam. But do you need to go out of the form? Absolutely not. If, you, if you're doing it right and you're doing your research well, everything is encompassed within the form. And that is the beauty of Indian classical dance. All Indian classical dances have that. So I hope that answers the question. Definitely, that was very nicely put. I mean, I had a, a, another presentation and another discussion. Uh, uh, very well, uh, somebody very well put it. The saying that somebody who dances for the audience is a beginner. Somebody who dances to impress your teacher is a mediocre dancer. Somebody who dances for him himself or herself is uh, the supreme dancer. It's like Natya Puja. You're, you're doing, you're devoting, your devotion shown through dancing. And that's, I think, is what you also men do. It. You first like, get in touch with yourself. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sindhu. Uh, and uh, Mira, Mira, there is something you want to, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Preet. And uh, thank you so much, Gayatri, ma'am. I mean, I also know why you quote students speaking because what an excellent narrator and communicator you are uh, through dance and otherwise. So uh, one, um, something that came to my mind is I have had some uh, training in classical dance, especially in Bharatanatyam, uh, but I've always liked literature more uh, and I mean poetry more in, in its written and written form. So uh, there was this one time I spoke to um, Amitav Ghosh, uh, a very uh, famous writer, who once said that um, good writing is a natural consequence of good reading. And uh, somehow I think uh, it, it is similar to what you said about dance as well, how reading is so important in dance as well. And uh, I had this question, it, is, it came 
because you were explaining how um, how the dancer was showing uh, honey as uh, you know the the bee coming to the lotus and all of that, and also that part where um, the dancer was showing kumkuma varna yeah. with the bindi uh, the hand. So I was wondering, um, is there to some extent a lack of words? Uh, or rather a lack of symbol for specific words like maybe honey or uh, maybe the color itself uh, does it restrict the dancer uh, and therefore ask of the dancer to look or do you feel as a dancer that uh, the lack of words also opens up um, a language of the body itself to communicate more effectively or does it work both ways as in does is there a limitation of words that uh, that you feel uh, might be you know how how does a limitation of words help or maybe restrict your communication while dancing so it really depends what you're trying to do thank you for an excellent question that's a really great question which i haven't thought of myself um so it depends what you're trying to do. If you're interpreting a very traditional 17th century Varnam, there's a very good chance that you have all the gestures you need. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to take a poem of Maya Angelou, like how uh, Maitri Prakash has done, she's another fantastic dancer. Um, you know, Maya Angelou's poem, she took and she, she placed it in the context of the Ramayana. And you know, you find sometimes you don't have a word for phenomenal. The, like the gesture for great and superior and phenomenal are all the same. It is only this gesture. So then it pushes you and you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a welcome challenge to say, what is the difference then between great and phenomenal? So is the difference between great and phenomenal in my eyes? Is it in the way I move my body? Is it in the way I, I use space on the stage? And that's when you realize the instruments available to you, the instruments available to your body are infinite. You, if there is something to be communicated, you will find a way to communicate it. And that is the great joy of dancing, right? Because even in writing poetry, we all have limitations. We have limitations of vocabulary. We have lim limitations of rhyme, meter, length, uh, language. We have so many limitations. It's the same thing when you're dancing, you're writing poetry with your body, your body has limitations and your gestures have limitations. And so it is largely that way symbiotic in the sense that the challenge is frustrating at first and then it becomes liberating. Uh, but I don't think that this is a universal answer. I do think it depends who you're talking to and which dancer you're speaking to. There's some dancers who, who don't believe in deviating from traditional gesture at all. Uh, and there are others like me who engage a lot with poetry and who feel that we need to broaden the movement vocabulary of dance to accommodate different other kinds of vocabulary. So again, this is a very preface, uh, you know, disclaimer. This is a very individual answer, but I hope it helps. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. And it was a delight listening to you. Thank you. Hello, Meera. Uh, there is a question by Sanjana. Harikaji, if you could unmute Sanjana. Yeah. Um, hello, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm not a dancer. I'm, I think I'm a poet. That's questionable. Okay. But that aside, um, one, so Amrita is like my friend. And one of the things that we often discuss is um, when I'm trying to perform my poetry, um, you know, um, one of the things that I've learned from like watching Amrita do dance is how she brings in the expressions and the, the, the facial movements. And from watching um, other, other dancers also engage with that. And I, and I wonder, since your talk has been about um, dance being an interpretive, inter, um, interpretive form of poetry, I wonder if you have anything to say about poets writing, um, what kind of what poetry can learn, and especially when you're trying to perform your poetry or you're trying to like use your voice and expressions and in, in some limited form, like um, your body when you're performing, is there something that we can learn from dance? So going back, yeah, like going this way rather than like that way, yeah. What a great question, Sanjana. Thank you for asking that. Um, 
when I was younger, I used to do a lot of slam poetry. Yeah, that, that's where like I'm kind of coming from as well, like spoken word and yeah. And, and the joy of doing slam is that you can actually use your body, but you can also use rhythm and cadence and all yeah. the other notions that come from a combination of hip hop and dance and, you know, different kind of rhythmic meters to, uh, to express yourself. And so if I had to learn one thing from dance, if I was a poet, it would be how to read visually, if that makes sense. So when you write your poem, give it some time, give it a couple of weeks, go back to it and say, when I read it, what images come to mind? Because that's the first thing a dancer is gonna do, mm -hmm. right? And the dancer proceeds to the next step, which is to recreate these images with the body and gesture and mind and expression and all that. You don't have to do that. But what, what will happen in that process is when you develop that image in your head, it will help you to change the emphasis on the way you read. So for example, let's say you're reading, uh, Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, right? And as you change mm -hmm. the emphasis, the meaning changes. And so this is something you can do with your own poetry because as you create that image, you say, Mary had a little lamb. What's the most enduring vision? What is the most enduring image in that line? It's the lamb, right? The lamb is the most enduring image. So therefore I put the emphasis on lamb. So those kind of exercises will help you and mm -hmm. will draw also from the notion of, of dance as a visual form and perhaps you and Amrita can sit and do this together as a, as a fun experience. Yeah. Uh, all the best and I look forward to seeing you on the circuit. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, Sanjana. I think we'll take one last question from uh, Ms. Aparna. Uh, if uh, uh, she could be unmuted. Uh, Niharika ji, if you could unmute Aparna Vijayan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Ma'am, Gayatri, ma'am, for this wonderful presentation. I actually wrote uh, the comment in the chat box uh, because it was not much of a question anymore. I think you already responded or addressed this point, which was, is the artist situated in the art or in the language of the art? Mm -hmm. And you beautifully brought out the body to sort of say that it's in both. Mm -hmm. And probably, according to me, you also might have suggested that they were never disconnected in the very first place. So I just wanted to know your comments on that. And I think uh, you did address it to some extent, but if you I still- I think, um, you know, Aparna, to, to be on, it's a great question. And uh, it's also a little bit of a heartbreaking question because the uh, the real answer to that is in, in the training of Bharatanatyam, the training of classical dance today. And the fact that no one is really able to train in the way that the great Devadasi gurus were. Uh, because they knew everything. They knew poetry, they knew music, they knew dan dance, they knew Natuangam, they knew everything there was to know. And therefore, when they're developing bodies for dance, those bodies have the intelligence of all those other interdisciplinary forms as well. And so I think, uh, so yes, you're absolutely right. It's the body and I have addressed this, but I do want to say that because we don't, all of us don't have access to that kind of training, it's more important for us as dancers to be aware and to do that extra work ourselves. So I hope that that answers the question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Saparna, for that question. And uh, Shankar, sir, if you have anything to comment. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Reed. Uh, I also have a question, if it is okay uh, for me to ask. Definitely. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Gayatri Madam, for the exquisite presentation. Uh, <clears throat> you, uh, it's often seen that there is a distinction made between uh, Kavya Rasa and uh, Natya Rasa. Uh, the experience that the connoisseur has uh, as a reader as or as a spectator. So uh, I think you must have answered this uh, this question, but I'll put it uh, put it across anyway. Uh, what does uh, what do you think? Dance offers over and above poetry, and poetry offer over and above dance. Surely, dance offers something better than poetry, and poetry also should have, or else uh, one would be redundant. One, one of these two would be redundant. So, I would like to ask what each of them offer um, uh, over and above the other. 
I think, uh, thank you, sir, for such a lovely question. I think uh, very simply put, and I am simplifying for the sake of time, um, when you listen to poetry as its own activity, the, as a rasika of poetry, that's just closing your eyes and listening to simply the words, the rhyme, the meter, the context, the sonic journey of poetry is what you are actually paying attention to. Whereas in dance, as I said earlier, there's a multi-sensory experience. There's the sound, there's a smell, there's a sight, there's touch, there's, and, and it's not that one of these experiences is necessarily better than the other. It's not a value judgment. It's two completely different experiences where one, the images are made in your mind. In the other, the images are already made for you. So what is in your mind is actually the environment. So what is open to interpretation is something entirely different. And therefore both stand in their own right as legitimate and complete aesthetic experiences. So I hope that answers the question, sir. Thanks a lot, ma'am, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, sir. And uh, ma'am, that was so eloquently put. Uh, Shrikan, sir, uh, I think uh, we could also take questions further in the group, but I just read out what Sarah's put up. Dance makes poetry accessible to many who may not have an uh, ear for poetry. Dance can help with interpretation of poetry. Uh, that is what Shrikan, sir, writes. Very true. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would now request Neera to give the word of thanks. So um, it was indeed a delight to listen to you, Gayatri, ma'am. And what a beautiful uh, way of con uh, conveying whatever you wanted to convey today, because we had a little bit from sculptures, a little bit from poetry and dance and all these uh, arts. So I'm sure everybody who came here had a little something of their own interest. And personally, for me, I heard a little bit about Ashtapatis, which is my personal favorite, and then again, poetry and dance and all of that. So it was extremely beautiful. So thank you on behalf of Team CSP for being with us today, for giving us this excellent talk. We will also be opening the Kavela WhatsApp group for further questions and comments, if at all there, there will be. So, and thank you, Shankar sir and Preet for all uh, co coordinating with us and then also Niharika for the technical support, Abhishek and Ashwini. And uh, last but not the least, our mentor and guide, uh, Dr. Sankita Menon, for conceptualizing this and making all of this happen. So thank you everybody again. And for all of you guys who join almost very consistently with us, like Amrita Valli, Sindhu, Sri Sanjanagari, so many of you all. So yeah, please do keep participating in all our Kabbalah events. We have another one coming on 24th uh, of this month. Uh, it is a Vividya session. So we welcome you all uh, to that session as well. So once again, thank you, everybody. And you all have a lovely day. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.